Blank Hospital, Washington, D.C. November 10th, 1863. Our precious Martin. Three cheers for dear father! It is impossible to tell you how happy your last letter made us. For the news of father's improved condition was so good we couldn't help laughing and crying over it. Brooke was a trump to telegraph right off and let us know the minute he was a good deal better. I rushed upstairs when the letter came and tried to thank God for being so good to us, but I could only cry and say, I'm glad, I'm glad. Didn't that do as well as a regular prayer? For I felt a great many in my heart. Mr. Brooke's daily reports bring us much comfort, and Meg reads them aloud to us at dinner each time we receive them, even though by dinner we've all read it. We have such funny times, and now I can enjoy them, for everyone is so desperately good. It's like living in a nest of turtle doves. You'd laugh to see Meg head the table and try to be motherish. The children are regular angels, and I, well, I'm Joe, and never shall be anything else. We are all well. I do my lessons always and never corroborate the girls. Meg says I mean contradict. So I put in both words, and you can take the properest. The girls are all as good as gold. Joe helps me with the sewing and insists on doing all sorts of hard jobs. Beth is as regular about her tasks as a clock and never forgets what you told her. Amy minds me nicely and tries very hard to learn what anyone will teach her. She does her own hair and I am teaching her to make buttonholes and mend her stockings. Mr. Lawrence watches over us like a motherly old hen, as Joe says, and Lori is very kind and neighborly. He and Joe keep us merry, for we get pretty blue sometimes and feel like orphans with you so far away. Hannah is a perfect saint. She does not scold at all and always calls Meg Miss Margaret now. We are all well and busy. But we long day and night to have you back. I send heaps of love to Papa. Give him my lovingest hug that ever was, and kiss yourself a dozen times for me. Oh, do come home soon to your loving little women. Thank you for joining us for this next installment of Little Women, a radio play. Joe! Are you up here? Joe! Josephine! What do you want? There you are. I should have known you'd be holed up in here writing. Right, which is very difficult to do while people are talking. Hence why I come up here. Oh, come now. You don't have time even for me? Not now, Teddy. Not even if I have a secret to share? I knew that would get your attention. What kind of secret? I know where Meg's glove is. Is that all? It's quite enough for the present, as you'll agree when I, when I tell you where it is. Tell, then. John Brooke has it. How do you know? Saw it. Where? Pocket. All this time? Yes. Isn't that romantic? No, it's horrid. Don't you like it? Of course I don't. It's ridiculous. Shh. It won't be allowed. My patience. What would Meg say? Shh, Joe? Uh, will you come with me to run errands and visit the Hummels? Not now, Beth. I've already had enough distractions. Go ask Meg. But Meg says she is too tired and... Not now, Beth. All right. I thought you'd be pleased. At the idea of anybody coming to take Meg away? No, thank you. I wish you hadn't told me. There's no harm in... Brooke is a good man, and it's not a crime to fall in love. <laughs> You'll feel better about it when someone comes to take you away. I'd like to see anyone try it. <laughs> so should I. I don't think secrets agree with me. Perhaps you should go share them with someone else. You can't tell her, Joe. It would ruin everything. I won't say anything. But I'd like to be left alone now, please. All right. All right. 
and no more romantic secrets. I make no promises. Ugh! Beth? Yes? What are you doing in Mommy's room? Nothing. I came to look at one of her books. Is that you crying? No. Yes? Only a little. Well, you look a fright. I was at the Hummels. But I thought Amy was going since your head ached so. I waited for Amy to come home for over an hour. You should have asked us then. I did ask you. You and Meg. But you had your writing and Meg was too tired. Yes, I was rather spoiled, wasn't I? Oh, Joe. Christopher Columbus, what's the matter? The baby, Joe. The baby's dead. What baby? Mrs. Hummels. It died in my lap before she got home. <laughs> oh, poor dear, how dreadful for you. I ought to have gone. Oh, Beth, come here. I'll hold you. It wasn't dreadful, Joe, only so sad. I saw in a minute it was sicker than before. They said her mother had gone for a doctor, so I took baby for a bit. It seemed to sleep, but all of a sudden it gave a little cry and trembled, and and I, I knew it was dead. <laughs> you cry? <laughs> what did you do? I just sat and held it till Mrs. Hummel came with the doctor. Scarlet fever, he said, and took one look at me and told me to go home and take some belladonna right away or I'd have it too. No, you won't. If you should be sick, I never could forgive myself. Is that why you hid away as I came in? Don't be frightened. I guess I shan't have it badly. I looked in Mother's book and saw that it begins with a headache, sore throat, and queer feelings like mine, so I did take some belladonna, and I feel better. You're burning up. Mother was only home. I'll call Hannah. She knows all about sickness. Don't let Amy come. She never had it, and I should hate to give it to her. Can't you and Meg have it over again? I guess not. Don't care if I do. Serve me right, lazing about on the couch pretending to be too sick for you. Now, what's all this nonsense? Hannah, you're prattling awake the whole house. Oh, Hannah, Beth's been over to the Hummels and has had a dreadful time of it. Scarlet fever, the doctor said. Did he? Yes. It took the baby, Hannah. That is a dreadful thing. By the looks, it's got a hold of you, too. Have you a sore throat, child? Yes. And headache, too? Yes. Here, let me have your forehead. That's a temperature, all right. Now I'll tell you what we'll do. We will have Dr. Bank just to take a look at you, dear, and see that we start right. Then we'll send Amy off to Aunt March's for a spell to keep her out of harm's way. And Joe can stay at home being easy for a day or two. Meg will have to not go to work as well so as not to give it to the King children. Won't Meg be sad? Not as sad as Amy. I wouldn't ask for a sentence at Aunt Marcia's for a King's ransom. Yes, Amy will take it worse. Don't worry. I'll have Laurie by then to tell her to soften the blow. In the meantime, let's get you out of your mother's room and into bed. There's no need to fear if we do what Dr. Bang says. Very well. And Joe, be gentle with Amy. She's liable to be cross about it. When am I ever not gentle with our precious Amy? I don't want to be sent off as if I was in the way. Amy, it's only for a bit, and you don't want to be sick, do you? No, I'm sure I don't. But I dare say I shall, for I've been with Beth all the time. Now be a sensible little woman and do as they say. Hear what a jolly plan I've got. You go to Aunt March's, and I'll come and take you out every day, driving or walking, and we'll have capital times. Won't that be better than moping here? But it's dull at Aunt March's, and she is so cross. It won't be dull with me popping in every day to tell you how Beth is. The old lady likes me, and I'll be as sweet as possible to her so she won't peck at you. Will you take me out trotting in the wagon with Puck? On my honor as a gentleman. And come every single day? See if I don't. See? It's settled then. I knew you'd see, Sven. I hardly think it was right to drag Lori into this. I suppose you think I wouldn't have relented without his offer. You'll accept it, though? Well, I guess I will. Ah, a miracle! Oh, hush you, Meg. 
Were you listening in the whole time? Not the whole time, no. Now I do believe you were all set against me. Oh, pish. Truly. Well, you can't back out now. Why not? It wouldn't be ladylike. And you'd hurt poor Lori's feelings. Yes, deeply so. I don't know whether I'm more annoyed about giving in or that you're confiscating to me. I think you mean condescending, dear. Oh, spite. Now, now, Amy. I meant what I said, every word. We shall have the grandest time, truly. Will you forgive me? Well, yes. But I'm still crossed with them. Acceptable. Shall we telegraph your mother, then? Well, if Beth is really ill, I think we should. But Hannah says we mustn't, for Mother can't leave Father, and it will only make him anxious. What's more, Mr. Brooks says Father's health has relapsed. Beth won't be sick long, and Hannah knows just what to do. And Mother did say we were to mind her. I suppose. But it doesn't seem quite right to keep it from her. Suppose you ask Grandfather after the doctor is there. Yes, that's the way of it. Joe, go and get Dr. Binns at once. We can't decide anything till he's been. Right. I shall be back within the hour. Stay where you are, Joe. I'm the errand boy for this establishment. Give my best to the little dear. We will. Lori. Yes? Thank you. For you, half the world. For Miss Amy, the rest of it. Goodbye, ladies. You know, I have great hopes for my boy. And why is that? There's just a, a soft spot in my heart for a boy who can jump a fence like that. Ugh. Well, I'm glad that was finally settled. Amy, where are you going? Amy, come back! I'll be in my room. So, which part of the March sisters' motto is that? Hoping or keeping busy? Oh, stuff it, Joe. What? Oh, come now! Beth was much sicker than anyone but Hannah and the doctor suspected. The girls knew nothing about illness, and Mr. Lawrence was not allowed to see her, so Hannah had everything her own way, and busy Dr. Banks did his best, but left a good deal to the excellent nurse. Jo devoted herself to Beth day and night, not a hard task, for Beth was very patient and bore her pain uncomplainingly as long as she could control herself. But the time came when the mild-mannered Beth acted unlike herself and frightened everyone. She pushed people away and furrowed her brow with anger when asked to sit up. How dark the days seemed now, how sad and lonely the house, and how heavy were the hearts of the sisters as they worked and waited while the shadow of death hovered over the once happy home. Meg took over Hannah's household responsibilities and wiped her tears as she tried to cook each evening. Amy, in her exile, longed eagerly to be at home that she might work for Beth, remembering with regretful grief how many neglected tasks those willing hands had done for her. Lori haunted the house like a restless ghost, and Mr. Lawrence locked the grand piano because he could not bear to be reminded of the young neighbor who used to make the twilight pleasant for him. The first of December was a wintry day indeed for them, for a bitter wind blew, snow fell fast, and the year seemed getting ready for its death. That morning, as Lori made his daily trek to the march home, he saw a girlish figure before him. Is that you, Joe? What are you doing pacing outside the house? You'll freeze off your fingertips. <coughs> what is it? Is Beth worse? I sent for Mother. Good for you, Joe. I know Hannah's intentions were good, but I feel your mother has a right to know and make the decision about where she is needed. No. Dr. Bangs came to see Beth again this morning, and she was worse, and he said... If Mrs. March can leave her husband, she better be sent for. No. He left us a bit ago and said some change, for better or for worse, would probably take place about midnight, at which time he would return. But, Joe, <laughs> it's not so bad as that. <laughs> yes, it is. She doesn't look like my Beth. She doesn't know us. She doesn't even talk about the flocks of doves outside her window or hold her precious doll. <laughs> There's nobody to help us bear it. Amy isn't here. I'm losing Beth, mother and father, both gone. And God seems so far away. I can't find him. <laughs> I'm here. Hold on to me, Joe. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Jenny. <laughs> Beth is my conscience. And I can't give her up. I can't. I can't. I don't think she will die. She's so good, and we all love her so much. I don't believe God will take her away yet. In books, the good and dear people always die. Don't talk that way. Soon your mother will be here, and then everything will be all right. When was the last time you slept? I sometimes nod off when she is one of her deep sleeps, but it isn't long before the fever causes me fits. She tries to play songs on the coverlet and sing themed hymns with a throat so swollen that it starts her coughing and a kind of angry desperation for air overtakes her. Then she calls for Marmy. I try to soothe her, but she pushes me away like a stranger and looks at me with these wild eyes and I must watch helplessly. It frightens me so that when I do try to sleep, all I see are those eyes. It sounds as if you're in need of some medicine. Is that mine? Grandfather sent it for Beth, but I think you should have the first sips. I don't suppose you have wine glasses with you? What would Marmy say? Your mother said she sees nothing wrong in the medicinal purposes of alcohol. Just drink it from the bottle. Is that the kind of trouble you get into in Europe? Just take it. We drink to the health of Beth. Health to my Beth. You are a good doctor, Lori, and such a comfortable friend. How can I ever pay you? I'll send my bill by and by, and tonight I'll give you something that'll warm your heart better than barrels of wine. What is it? Your family must forgive my interference. I telegraphed your mother yesterday, and Brooke answered and said she'd come at once. What? She'll be here tonight. Lori! Aren't you glad I did? Oh, mother, I'm so glad! Oh, Lori, I could kiss you! Oh, please forget I said that. I didn't mean to, but you were such a dear to go and do it in spite of Hannah. I don't mind. Tell me all about it, and don't give me wine again. It makes me act so. Why, you see, I got fidgety, and so did Grandpa. We thought Hannah was overdoing the authority business, and your mother ought to know. She'd never forgive us if Beth... Well, if anything happened, you know. Your mother will come on the late train tonight at 2 a.m. I shall go for her. And you've got only to bottle up your rapture and keep Beth well until then. Lori, you're an angel. How shall I ever thank you? You could offer to kiss me again. I quite liked it. No, thank you. <laughs> Unless I should offer the same thanks to your grandfather. I must go and tell Beth. Would you please tell Amy when you visit her today? Of course. And Aunt March. I'll head there now. Don't forget the wine. Bless you, Teddy. Bless you. Hold on, Beth. Mommy will be here soon. Did you hear me? Marmy, she's coming. Lori brought you a note sent from Amy this afternoon. She must be having an awful time at Aunt March's because today she asked the maid to help her write a will. <laughs> to Meg, her art supplies. To you, all of her dolls, books, and clothes. To me, her bronze inkstand, for which she blames me for losing the cap. Oh, and she left each of us a lock of her curls. <laughs> it all started, Lori said, because Aunt March pointed out a turquoise ring and said Amy would have it after she died. Seeing it as a very proper and mature thing to do, she's listed all of her belongings. Seems unlikely for young Amy, of all people, to... Don't leave me, Bethy. Please. <coughs> Hannah! Bring more water! She's having another fit! Marmy? Marmy? Marmy! Joe, where is Marmy? Joe, I need her, please. Marmy, come here. Where is that doctor? He's nearly two hours late. 
He said around midnight is when he would be finished with all his patients. He also said that would be when Beth would take a turn. What if she needs him? Mr. Lawrence. I'm sorry, girls. I, I just wish there was something I could do. Dr. Banks! I apologize for my delay. How is she? Asleep now, but Hannah was changing her sheets once again. I'm going with you. I must see her. Money is no object, Doctor. If the question of payment... I'm doing everything I can, Mr. Lawrence. Yes, yes, I know. Let's go at once. Stay with me, Joe. Please, but... I can't bear to hear what the doctor has to say. What if she... Move over. I'll sit on the step above you. God spares Beth. I never will complain again. I wish I had no heart. It aches so. If life is often as hard as this, I don't see how we ever shall get through it. Hannah sent me to the market today. Ten different people sought me out to ask about Beth. People I never noticed. The butcher. The milkman. Owen oh, poor Mrs. Hummel, she was pulling her money together to buy a shroud. It seems our shy little mouse has more friends than anyone in town. I wonder if there are many Beths in the world. Shy and quiet, sitting in corners until needed. And living for others so cheerfully that no one sees the sacrifices that the little cricket on the hearth stops chirping. Joel! Meg! Not my Beth. Not yet. It's all right. The fever's turned. She's sleeping natural. Her skin's damp and she breathes easy. Praise be given. Oh my goodness me. Yes, my dears. I think the little girl will pull through. This time. Keep the house quiet. Let her sleep. And when she wakes, give her... Girls! Marmy! Oh, my little Beth. Is she? She's going to make it. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh, my daughter. Hello, Marmy. Oh, my Beth. Oh, thank God. I don't think I have any words in which to tell the meeting of the mother and daughters. Such hours are beautiful to live, but very hard to describe, so I will leave it to the imagination, merely saying that the house was full of genuine happiness. Beth continued to improve. Mr. Brooke reported that Mr. March's small relapse had appeared to be over, and, a few days later, Lori retrieved Amy from Aunt March's. Another happy reunion took place in the March household. Like sunshine after a storm were the peaceful weeks which followed. Beth was soon able to lie on the study sofa all day, amusing herself. Joe took her on daily walks about the house to improve her stiff joints, supporting her delicate sister more than she dared admit to herself. Meg cheerfully blackened and burned her white hands cooking delicate messes for her sisters. And Amy, a more grateful girl since spending time with Aunt March, thought that it was very proper to give away as many of her treasures as she could prevail on her sisters to accept. Several weeks of unusually mild weather fitly ushered in a splendid Christmas day. Hannah felt in her bones that it was going to be an unusually fine day, and she proved herself a true prophetess, for everybody and everything seemed bound to produce a grand success. Hi girls, how kind you are. I've been needing oven mitts for a long time and these are much nicer than what you've had. Thank you dear. Merry Christmas Hannah. We've been planning this gift for months now. It feels glorious not to keep secrets anymore. I almost let it slip that you'd be getting new ones last week. One of the many joys of giving. <laughs> 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 I'm so full of happiness I couldn't hold one drop more. Merry Christmas, Lori, my dear. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Lori. <laughs> Merry Christmas, indeed. You're late. Where is your grandfather? Isn't he joining us for dinner? You've already missed the presents. We have one more present for the March family. Merry Christmas, my girls. Father! <laughs> Hello, my dears. Hello. My love. My darling. Oh. Let's get you sitting down, Mr. March. I'm so sorry. Getting back into the porch. 
Well, Hannah, I for one am most excited to tear into this lovely turkey you've prepared. You surprised us so that my mind was so flustered that it's a miracle I didn't roast the pudding and stuff the turkey with raisins. <laughs> <laughs> but first, I wanted to thank you all. To the Lawrences, I thank you for your friendship, generosity, and for loving your neighbors so graciously. My mind was at ease knowing my family was cared for by such kind souls. I don't see how we could help it. A mutually beneficial friendship, I assure you. And we are grateful for your return, so that we may continue to learn more about the Marches. My loyal companion, Mr. John Brooks, I hope this is the first of many celebrations we will share with you. Mrs. March and I have grown very fond of you these many weeks, and I am grateful for your wisdom and steady presence, John. Sir? And finally, I thank God for his provision and all-knowing plan for keeping my family and bringing us together again. Amen. Amen. Just a year ago, you were groaning over the dismal Christmas we expected to have. Do you remember? A rather pleasant year on the whole. I think it's been a pretty hard one. I'm glad it's over, because we've got you back, Father. Rather a rough road for you to travel, my little pilgrims, especially the latter part of it. But you have got on bravely, and I think the burdens are in a fair way to tumble off very soon. How do you know? Did Mother tell you? Not much. Straws show which way the wind blows, and I've made several discoveries today. Oh? Tell us what they are. Meg, I remember a time when this hand was white and smooth, and your first care was to keep it so. It was very pretty then, but to me it is much prettier now. In these little nicks and calluses, I see your character. A burnt offering has been made to vanity. I am proud to shake this hand, and I will be reluctant to give it away someday. Thank you. I observed that Amy set the table at dinner, ran errands for her mother all the afternoon, and has waited on everyone with patience and good humor. I also observed that she does not fret much or look in the glass. I conclude she has decided to try and mold her character as carefully as she molds her little clay figments. I am glad of this, for though I should be very proud of a graceful statue made by her, I shall be infinitely prouder of a lovable daughter with a talent for making life beautiful to herself and others. What about Joe? Please say something nice, for she has tried so hard and been so very, very good to me. <laughs> In spite of the curly crop, I don't see the son Joe whom I left a year ago. I see a young lady who pins her collar straight, laces her boots neatly, and only whistles and talks slang on occasion. Her face is rather thin and pale just now, with watching and anxiety, but I like to look at it. It has grown gently. Her voice is lower. I rather miss my wild girl, but if I get a strong, helpful, tender-hearted woman in her place, I shall feel quite satisfied. I don't know if the shearing sobered our black sheep, but I do know that in all Washington, I couldn't find anything that was beautiful enough to be bought with the $25 my good girl sent me. Now, Beth. There's so little of her, I'm afraid to say much for fear she will slip away altogether. Though she is not so shy as she used to be. I've got you safe, my daughter. And I'll keep you safe. Please. Robert. I'm sorry. I'll tell you what I see, Beth. I see a girl becoming a woman. A woman with a sweet, sunshiny presence that takes care of her family and community and never asks for thanks or recognition. A little mouse has become a dedicated pilgrim and faces her fears with such bravery that it impressed the men of Congress. Like bees swarming after their queen, mother and daughters hovered around Mr. March in the following weeks, sometimes neglecting everything to look at, wait upon, and listen to their patient, who was in a fair way to be killed by kindness. As he sat propped up in a big chair by Beth's sofa, with the other three close by and Hannah popping in her head now and then to peek at the dear man, nothing seemed needed to complete their happiness. But something was needed, and the elder ones felt it, though none confessed the fact. Mr. and Mrs. March looked at one another with an anxious expression as their eyes followed Meg. Joe was unsettled by everyone's odd behavior. Meg, for her part, was absent-minded, shy, and silent, started when the bell rang. Amy thought, Everyone seemed to be waiting for something and couldn't settle down, which was odd since Father was safe at home. And Beth innocently wondered why their neighbors didn't run over as usual. 
On a late January day, Joe decided to confront Meg about it as they returned home from a day of work. Are you in love? What? Are you? No. Not even with your John Brooke? Don't say my John. It isn't proper or true. Please don't plague me, Joe. I've told you I don't care much about him, and there isn't to be anything said, but we're all to be friendly and go on as before. We can't. Something has been said, and this mischief has spoiled you for me. Ever since Father and Mother asked you to stay downstairs when I went up to bed a few days after Christmas, you haven't been yourself. Oh, Joe. I'll tell you, but you mustn't be angry. Sit here on the fence with me. I don't want Amy and Beth to hear about it. Not yet. Now, speak. Mother and Father took me into Father's study and asked me what my opinion was of Mr. Brooke. I told them of his kindness and of his thoughtful letters, but nothing more. Nothing of your missing glove and your sudden affection for brown eyes? Joe! I saw how the two of you wrote letters and most certainly went beyond mother and father. Do you want to know or not? All right, all right. Go on. Mother said that John went with her at Mr. Lawrence's request and was so devoted to poor father that they couldn't help becoming fond of him. He was perfectly open and honorable and told them that he loved me. Oh, Meg. But would earn a comfortable home before he asked me to marry him. He only wanted their permission to work for me and ask if I may love him too. Mother and father liked him well, but would not consent to me engaging myself so young. Of course not. It would be idiotic. You are only 17. I'm nearly 18 now, Joe. Many girls my age are already promised to someone. Anyway... Father told Mr. Brooke that I must wait until I was 20 to be engaged, but that he may ask me for my love. Well, it's no wonder everyone is so skittish. All the sneaking about. Does Lori know? I think so. Though I doubt that John told him. He must have figured it himself or was told by his grandfather. But I can't say anything until Mr. Brooke speaks or it would cause more unease. If he did speak, you wouldn't know what to say, but would cry or blush or let him have his own way, instead of giving him a good, decided no. I'm not so silly and weak as you think. I know just what I should say, for I've planned it all, and I needn't be taken by surprise. Would you mind telling me what you'd say? Oh, I should merely say, quite calmly and decidedly, Thank you, Mr. Brooke. You are very kind. But I agree with Father that I am too young to enter into any engagement at present, so please say no more and let us be friends as we were. Hmm. That's stiff and cruel enough. I don't believe you'll ever say it, and I know he won't be satisfied if you do. If he does go on like the rejected lovers in books, you'll give in rather than hurt his feelings. Let's go inside then, young ingenue. No, I won't. I shall tell him I've made up my mind and shall walk out of the room with dignity. Is that you, Meg? Come to the parlor. Yes, Mother. Oh. Hello, Miss March. Good grief. Joe, will you join us in my study? Mr. Brooke has something rather personal to discuss with Meg. Certainly. Meg, remember what we discussed. Are you afraid of me, Margaret? How can I be afraid when you've been so kind to Father? I only wish I could thank you for it. You could begin by looking me in the eye again, if it pleases you, as you've done before. You have the most beautiful brown eyes. I know what you're going to ask, and the answer is, I don't know. I'm not here to ask to marry you. I know that you are too young. I don't know if I love you. I see. Could you try and find out? I want to know so much for... I love you. I don't know. Then I will wait, if you think you could learn to love me. I love to teach, and this is easier than German, I promise. Meg? I don't choose. I don't want to think of these things. Please go away and leave me be. Do you really mean that? John, I... I think you should go. Uh-oh. I... Josephine! Aunt March? Bless me! What's all this, Margaret? Holding hands with a stranger? Oh. This is Father's friend. 
I'm so surprised to see you. That's evident. But what is Father's friend saying to make you look like a peony? There's mischief going on, and I insist upon knowing what it is. We were only talking. Mr. Brooke was just going. Brooke? That boy's tutor? Ah, I understand now. The Lawrence boy became nervous when talking about you and my niece, saying you were awfully fond of one another. You haven't gone and accepted him, have you? Hush, Aunt March. We've discussed nothing of the sort. Tell me, do you mean to marry this rook? If you do, not one penny of my money ever goes to you. Remember that and be a sensible girl. His name is Brooke, and I shall marry whom I please, Aunt March. You can leave your money to anyone you like. Tidy, tidy! Is that the way you take my advice, miss? You'll be sorry for it by and by when you've tried love in a cottage and found it a failure. It can't be a worse one than some people find in big houses. Now, Meg, my dear, be reasonable and take my advice. I mean it kindly and don't want you to spoil your whole life by making a mistake at the beginning. You ought to marry well and help your family. It's your duty to make a rich match and it ought to be impressed upon you. Father and mother don't think so. They like John, though he is poor. Your parents, my dear, have no more worldly wisdom than a pair of babies. I'm glad of it. This nook is poor and hasn't got any rich relations, has he? No, but he has many warm friends. <laughs> you can't live on friends. Try it and see how cool they'll grow. He hasn't any business, has he? Not yet. Mr. Lawrence is going to help him. That won't last long, will it, Cook? James Lawrence is a crotchety old fellow and not to be depended on. I... His name is Brooke. John Brooke. So you intend to marry a man without money, position, or business and go on working harder than you do now when you might be comfortable all your days minding me and doing better? I thought you had more sense, Meg. I couldn't do better if I waited half my life. John is good and wise. He's got heaps of talent. He's willing to work and sure to get on. He's so energetic and brave. Everyone likes and respects him. I'm proud to think he cares for me, though I am so poor and young and silly. He knows you've got rich relations, child. That's the secret of his liking, I suspect. Aunt March, how dare you say such a thing? My John wouldn't marry for money any more than I would. We are willing to work and we mean to wait. I am not afraid of being poor. For I have been happy so far, and I know I shall be with him because he loves me, and I... I love him. Meg? Do you mean it? You, you love me? I didn't know how much till I thought of life without you. Well, I wash my hands of the whole affair. You are a willful child, and you've lost more than you know by this piece of folly. Aunt March? Sister? I'm disappointed in you, Meg. And I won't stay in a house where I'm disrespected. Don't expect anything from me when you are married. Your Mr. Brooks' friends must take care of you. I'm done with you forever. Ha! I should go after her. Sit back down in the study, Robert. Yes, dear. Aunt March! Wait. Mr. Brook, you stand there with tears in your eyes? Has my Meg treated you so harshly? No, Sister Cho, I'm overcome with joy. You should congratulate us. What? I promise to work joyfully for you, my Margaret. Oh, John. Father, come in here quick. John Brooke is acting dreadfully, and Meg likes it. Other than Joe and Aunt March, everyone was overjoyed by the match, and John was soon accepted as part of their family. Later in the week, a celebratory dinner was held to welcome John. While everyone cooed and petted over the couple, Mr. and Mrs. March proudly surveying Meg's mature conduct, Lori found Joe in the corner. Doesn't three years seem very long to wait? I've got so much to learn before I shall be ready. It seems a short time to me. You have only to wait. I am to do the work, my dear. You don't look festive, ma'am. <laughs> What's the matter? I don't approve of the match, but I've made up my mind to bear it, and shall not say a word against it. You can't know how hard it is for me to give up Meg. You don't give her up. You only go halves. She promised me we'd be sisters first. Forever. It can never be the same again. 
I've lost my dearest friend. Well, you've got me anyhow. I'm not good for much, I know, but I'll stand by you, Joe. Upon my word, I will. I know you will, Teddy. <laughs> well, now, don't be dismal. Marriage isn't all bad. Meg is happy and will continue to be happy. And Brooke is a good man. We'll have capital times after she is gone, for I shall be through college before long, and then we'll go abroad on some nice trip or other. Wouldn't that console you? I rather think it would, but there's no knowing what may happen in three years. It's true. Don't you wish you could take a look forward and see where we shall all be then? I do. I think not, for I might see something sad. And everyone looks so happy now. I don't believe they could be much improved. Perhaps you would see more celebrations. Think of all the future engagements you'll have to celebrate. Don't talk of such things. We don't want any more marrying in this family for years to come. You're a mere infant, but you'll go next, Joe. And perhaps Amy or Beth will be sulking in the corner. Don't count on it. There should always be one old maid in a family, and nobody will want me. You won't give anyone a chance. You won't show the soft side of your character. And if a fellow gets a peep at it by accident and can't help showing that he likes it, you get so thorny no one dares touch or look at you. I'm too busy to be worried with nonsense, and I think it's dreadful to break up families so. Now don't say any more about it. I don't wish to get cross, so let's change the subject. Mark my words, Joe, you'll go next. <laughs> now let's stop sulking and join the party. <laughs> All right. As readers of this story, we have the power that Laurie craved to look forward three years into the lives of these characters, which is where our story picks up again. The three years that have passed have brought changes to the quiet family. The war is over, and Mr. March is safely at home, busy with his books and the small parish which found in him a minister. The girls gave their hearts into their mother's keeping, their souls into their fathers, and to both parents they gave a love that grew with their growth and bound them tenderly together. Mrs. March is as brisk and cheery, though rather grayer, than when we saw her last, and just now is absorbed in Meg's affairs. John Brooke did his duty in the war for a year, was wounded, was sent home, and was not allowed to return. Perfectly resigned to his discharge, he devoted himself to getting well, preparing for business, and earning a home for Meg. With the good sense and sturdy independence that characterized him, he refused Mr. Lawrence's more generous offers and accepted the place of bookkeeper, feeling better satisfied to begin with an honestly earned salary than by running any risks with borrowed money. Meg had spent the time in working as well as waiting, growing womanly in character and prettier than ever, for love is a great beautifier. She had her girlish ambitions and hopes and felt some disappointment at the humble way in which the new life must begin. Ned Moffat had just married Sally Gardner, and Meg couldn't help contrasting their fine house and carriage, many gifts, and splendid outfits with her own, and secretly wishing she could have the same. But somehow, envy and discontent soon vanished when she thought of all the patient love and labor John had put into the little home awaiting her with her wedding around the corner. Joe never went back to Aunt March, for the old lady took such a fancy to Amy that she bribed her with the offer of drawing lessons from one of the best teachers around. As Joe knew well, Aunt March was hard to please, but Amy prospered finely and learned when to take offense and when to forgive the old lady without asking. Joe, meantime, devoted herself to literature and Beth, who remained delicate long after the fever was a thing of the past. She had improved, but was never again the rosy, healthy creature she had been yet always hopeful, happy, and serene, and busy with the quiet duties she loved. While Joe had come to forgive Meg for breaking her promise, she was a dutiful maid of honor with the best plans laid to send John Brooke away if Meg came to her senses and refused him at the altar. Lori, having dutifully gone to college to please his grandfather, was now getting through it in the easiest possible manner to please himself. A universal favorite, thanks to money, manners, and talent, he stood in great danger of being spoiled in high society, and probably would have been, like many another promising boy, if he had not possessed a talisman against evil in the memory of the kind old man who was bound up in his success, the motherly friend who watched over him as if he were her son, and last, but not least by any means, 
the knowledge that four innocent girls loved, admired, and believed in him with all their hearts. The morning of Meg's wedding, everyone had a job, and they were focused on the task at hand. But there was a kind of peace at having everyone working together again, a rare occasion as more adult responsibilities filled their time. A sense of new beginnings and sweet friendship filled the air in the fields between the March and Lawrence Palmers. When you're done with the seating, Lori, can you help Beth and your grandfather with the cakes? They will need an extra hand. Aye, aye, Captain. Mr. Brooke, don't spoil your suit before the ceremony has even begun. Roll your sleeves up before you tear it on a nail. Don't. Meg, I forgot if you wanted Marmy to carry the daisies like us or something different. I'm sure Lori could find something in the conservatory. The daisies are fine, Joe. Are you? I'm perfect. I'm happy for you. Don't you see? I see, but you needn't work with such passion. I thought you wanted to get married. I'm just trying to make it all that you wanted. Have you changed your mind? If you have, I... <laughs> I'm not leaving you, you know. John and I will live a short walk away, and you and I will still be the best of friends. So you've said. I just want things for you to be perfect. I don't want a perfect wedding. I just want to be married to my John and celebrate with my family. With my Joe. Not a dictator that looks like her. I'm going to miss you. Who else is going to be able to talk sense into me? If you do change your mind, just say the word. <laughs> Thank you for the option, Joe. Upon my word, here's a state of things. Aunt March. Your guests are beginning to arrive. I'll be off to finish everything. Hello, Aunt March. I'm so glad you decided to come. You oughtn't to be seen till the last minute, child. I'm not a show, Auntie. And no one is coming to stare at me, to criticize my dress or count the cost of my luncheon. I'm too happy to care what anyone says or thinks, and I'm going to have my little wedding just as I like it. Meg, dear, do you know where... Oh, Aunt March. How glad we are to see you. Oh, doesn't Meg look wonderful, Aunt March? She made her dress herself. An accomplishment, I'm sure. I really am glad you're here, Aunt March. I wish you well, my dear. I heartily wish you well, but I think you'll be sorry for it. I'll take my chances, but thank you for your concern. You've got a treasure, young man. See that you deserve it. <laughs> yes, Aunt March. Jupiter Amon, Joe's upset the cake again! <laughs> <laughs> see they don't get into any more trouble. Please, take your seat. Amy, come find us for the ceremony when you're ready. Don't let that young Lawrence come near me, Amy. He worries me worse than mosquitoes. Lori has promised to be very good today, and he can be perfectly elegant if he likes. That was before college. Now he drinks openly, is seen playing billiards. I can't imagine what his grandfather must think. Well, Aunt March, perhaps you should ask him today. But we won't ask Lori to leave us. Not today. Now you may sit here, and I must find the bride and take my place at the front. Aren't you joining the procession? Didn't I tell you? There is none. Good heavens! When the time came, a sudden silence fell upon the group as Mr. March and the young couple took their places under the green arch. Mother and sisters gathered close, as if loath to give Meg up. The fatherly voice broke more than once, which only seemed to make the service more beautiful and solemn. The bridegroom's hand trembled visibly, and no one heard his replies. But Meg looked straight up in her husband's eyes and said, I will, with such tender trust in her own face and voice that her mother's heart rejoiced, and Aunt March sniffed audibly. Jo did not cry, though she was very near to it once and was only saved from a demonstration by the consciousness that Lori was staring fixedly at her with a comical mixture of merriment and emotion in his wicked black eyes. Beth kept her face hidden on her mother's shoulder, but Amy stood like a graceful statue with the most becoming ray of sunshine touching her white forehead and the flower in her hair. During the next 15 minutes, she looked more like a rose than ever, for everyone availed themselves of their privileges to the fullest extent, from Mr. Lawrence to old Hannah, who, adorned with a headdress fearfully and wonderfully made, fell upon her in the hall, crying with a sob and a chuckle. It was a joyous ceremony, followed by a cheery dancing and a feast. Even the rich Mrs. Sally Moffat remarked, 
That is the prettiest wedding I've seen to for an age, Ned, and I don't see why, for there wasn't a bit of style about it as they drove away. And that evening, gruff Mr. Lawrence, bowied by the wedding, told his grandson, Laurie, my lad, if you ever want to indulge in this sort of thing, get one of those little March girls to help you, and I shall be perfectly satisfied. I'll do my best to gratify you, sir. How's the little mother? Where is everybody? Why didn't you tell me before I came home? Happy as a queen, my dear. Every soul of them is upstairs a worshipping. We didn't want no hurry canes round. Now you go into the parlor and I'll send them down to you. Is that you, Lori? Yes, Beth, may I come up? Stay there and shut your eyes and hold out your arms. No, thank you. I'd rather not. I shall drop it or smash it as sure as fate. Then there will be no meeting. I will, I will. Only you must be responsible for the damages. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lori. Putting it in your arms. <laughs> Twins? By <laughs> Jupiter! <laughs> take them quick, somebody. I'm going to laugh and I shall drop them. Here, let me take one and sit by you. It's the best joke of the season, isn't it? I wouldn't have told you, for I set my heart on surprising you, and I flatter myself I've done it. I never was more staggered in my life. Isn't it fun? What are you going to name them? Let's have another look. Boy and girl. Aren't they beauties? Meg is thrilled. She sends her love and would like to see you in a few days. Most remarkable children I ever saw. Which is which? Amy put a blue ribbon on the boy and a pink on the girl. French fashion. So you can always tell. Besides, one has blue eyes and one brown. Kiss them, Uncle Teddy. I'm afraid they mightn't like it. Of course they will. They're used to it now. Do it this minute, sir. <laughs> <laughs> there, I knew they didn't like it. That's the boy. See him kick. He hits out with his fists like a good one. Now then, young Brooke, pitch into a man at your own size, will you? Who's to be named John Lawrence and the girl Margaret after her mother and grandmother? We shall call her Daisy, so as not to have too many. And I suppose the Manny will be Jack, unless we find a better name. Name him Demi John and call him Demi for short. Daisy and Demi, just the thing. I knew Teddy would do it. Aww. Aww. Other than visiting Meg and their precious niece and nephew, the remaining March sisters each kept themselves plenty busy. Beth was learning more and more about how to run a home from Hannah and Marmy, and she found joy in the kitchen and her sewing. Mrs. March was glad to have Beth as a companion, but worried about her daughter when her expression became drawn and distracted. These moments were fleeting, and she would never let on as to why. Beth still was most herself when sitting at her beloved instrument, many times composing tunes she would never play anyone other than Mr. Lawrence. It takes people a long time to learn the difference between talent and genius. Amy was learning this distinction through much tribulation, Mistaking enthusiasm for inspiration, she attempted every branch of art with youthful audacity. For a long time, there was a lull in the mud pie business, and she devoted herself to the finest pen and ink drawing. This was then exchanged for charcoal portraits, then oil painting, and then a mania for sketching nature, which left her with many colds from sitting in the damp grass of the meadows that Hannah forbade it. She was learning and enjoying other things meanwhile for she had resolved to be an attractive and accomplished woman, even if she never became a great artist. Here she succeeded better, for she was one of those happily created beings who please without effort, make friends everywhere, and take life so gracefully and easily that other souls are tempted to believe that such are born under a lucky star. Every few weeks, Jo would shut herself up in her room and fall into a vortex, as she expressed it, writing away at her novel with all her heart and soul. Till that was finished, she could find no peace. She did not think herself a genius by any means, but when the writing fit came on, she gave herself up to it with entire abandon and led a blissful life unconscious of want, care, or bad weather. Sleep forsook her eyes, meals went untasted, day and night were all too short to enjoy the happiness which blessed her only at such times. This made the hours worth living, even if they bore no other fruit. Recently, she had taken to publishing thrilling, vapid stories in the papers in town under a pen name. She knew Mother specifically would not approve of her labyrinths of love, mystery, and murder that were popular and paid somewhat well, so kept them a secret. 
While Jo enjoyed the independence and validation of her skills through the paper, the guilt of this secret sometimes made her cross or despondent, especially with Amy. This was the case one autumn evening as Jo and Amy returned home from making social calls throughout town. You might treat him civilly, at least. I don't like him! He puts on airs, snubs his sisters, worries his father, and doesn't speak respectfully of his mother. Lori says he isn't trustworthy, and I don't consider him a desirable acquaintance, so I let him alone. What are the two of you arguing about? Joe has the most abominable manners, Mother. Only when I don't see a reason for putting on airs over people who are unkind or treat us like we're silly things without minds. Joe. I didn't say anything unkind, Marmy. I only acted how I felt and wasn't dishonest over whether I liked someone or not. Especially that Mr. Tudor. Women should learn to be agreeable, particularly poor ones, for they have no other way of repaying the kindnesses they receive. If you'd remember that and practice it, you'd be better liked than I am. Oh! You know what I mean. You can make your own social calls instead of ruining mine. But I think girls ought to show when they disapprove of young men and how can they do it except by their manners? Preaching does not do any good, as I know to my sorrow, since I've had Teddy to manage. But there are many little ways in which I can influence him without a word. And I say we ought to do it to others if we can. If we were bells or women of wealth and position, we might do something, perhaps. So we are to countenance things and people which we detest merely because we are not bells and millionaires, are we? That's a nice sort of morality. I can't argue about it. I only know that it's the way of the world. And people who set themselves against it only get laughed at for their pains. Did Aunt March tell you that? That is only my observation. And you should apologize to the poor woman embarrassing her in front of company today. It was only Aunt Carol. Aunt Carol? Carol was there? Is she getting along all right? Yes, she is. And I found her to have lovely conversations, all about her travels and what a pleasure it is to help others. I don't think she meant real charity, but the favors of the rich granted to their rich friends. But you needn't tell her you thought that as you did. Later, Aunt Carol lectured me on the importance of language. As if she didn't know that what I enjoy most is wordsmithing and writing. She meant foreign language. I can't help it if French is such a slippery, silly sort of language to me. Oh, you are incorrigible, Joe March! I am sorry, Marmy. It sounds worse than I thought it was when she lays it all out like that. I just can't stand to allow those who would be so smug about their self-righteousness and... <clears throat> I know, you don't have to say it. Rain in the temper, Joe. All right. I will apologize to Amy for embarrassing her. Thank you, my dear. Before you go upstairs, may I talk to you for a minute? What have I done now? No, no, nothing like that. I'm anxious about Beth. Why, Mother, she has seemed unusually well since the baby came. It's not her health that troubles me now. It's her spirits. I'm sure there is something on her mind, and I want you to discover what it is. What makes you think so, Mother? She sits alone a good deal and doesn't talk to her father as much as she used to. I found her crying over the babies the other day. When she sings, the songs are always sad ones. And now and then I see a look in her face that I don't understand. This isn't like Beth, and it worries me. Have you asked her about it? I have tried once or twice, but she either evaded my questions or looked so distressed that I stopped. I never force my children's confidence, and I seldom have to wait for long. I think she is growing up, and so begins to dream dreams and have hopes and fears and fidgets, without knowing why or being able to explain them. Why, Mother, Beth's eighteen, but we don't realize it and treat her like a child, forgetting she's a woman. So she is? Dear heart, how fast you do grow up. Can't be helped, Marmy. So you must resign yourself to all sorts of worries and let your birds hop out of their nest one by one. I promise never to hop very far, if that is any comfort to you. It's a great comfort, Joe. I always feel strong when you're at home now that Meg is gone. Beth is too feeble and Amy too young to depend upon. But when the tug comes, you are always ready. Why, you know I don't mind hard jobs much, and there must be always one scrub in a family. Amy is splendid and fine works, and I'm not. But I feel in my element when all the carpets are to be taken up, or half the family falls sick at once. I'm your man. I leave Beth to your hands, then, for she will open her tender little heart to her Joe sooner than to anyone else. 
be very kind, and don't let her think anyone watches or talks about her. If she would only get quite strong and cheerful again, I shouldn't have a wish in the world. Happy woman! I've got heaps of wishes! My dear, what are they? I'll settle Bethy's troubles, and then I'll tell you mine. They are not very wearing, so they'll keep. <laughs> what are you doing by the window, Beth? <laughs> Beth? Are you crying? <laughs> what is it? I thought you were sleeping. Is it the old pain, my dear? <laughs> no. It's a new one. But I can bear it. Tell me all about it and let me cure it, as I often did the other. You can't. There is no cure. Shall I call Mother? No. No, don't call her. Don't tell her, please. I shall be better soon. Will you help me to bed? I think I just need to rest my poor head. I'll be quiet and go to sleep. Hmm. You don't have a fever. You don't appear sick. Does anything trouble you? Yes, Joe. Wouldn't it comfort you to tell me what it is? Not now. Not yet. Then I won't ask. But remember, Bethy, that Mother and I are always glad to hear and help you, if we can. I know it. I'll tell you by and by. Is the pain better now? Oh yes, much better. Will you lay here with me? You are so comfortable, Joe. Go to sleep, dear. I'll stay with you. As Joe pondered Beth's condition and kept her pain a secret, as promised, another blow came. Mr. and Mrs. March read the letter in front of Joe and Beth carefully. It informed them that Aunt Carol and Aunt March wished to go abroad and wanted one of the girls to accompany them. Amy? Oh, Father, she's too young! It's my turn first. I've wanted it so long. It would do me so much good and be so altogether splendid. I must go. I'm afraid it's impossible, Joe. Aunt says Amy, decidedly, and it is not for us to dictate when she offers such a favor. It's always so. Amy has all the fun and I have all the work. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. I'm afraid it's partly your own fault, dear. When Aunt spoke to me the other day, she regretted your blunt manners and too independent spirit. And here she writes, as if quoting something you had said. I planned at first to ask Joe, but as favors burden her and she hates French, I think I won't venture to invite her. Amy is more docile, will make a good companion to Aunt Carol and myself, and will receive gratefully any help the trip may give her. Oh, my tongue! My abominable tongue! Why can't I learn to keep it quiet? I wish you could have gone. But there is no hope of it this time. So try to bear it cheerfully, and don't sadden Amy's pleasure by reproaches or regrets. Your mother is upstairs telling her about it now. I'll take a leaf out of her book and try not to only seem glad, but to be so, and not grudge her one minute of happiness. But it won't be easy, for it is a grudgeful disappointment. Joe, dear, I'm very selfish, but I couldn't spare you. And I'm glad you're not going to her. Thank you, Beth. We've heard! Congratulations, Amy. It sounds like such fun. Isn't a mere pleasure trip, dear girls? It will decide my career, sir. If I have any genius, I shall find it out in Rome and, and do something to prove it. Suppose you haven't? Then I shall come home and teach drawing for my living. No, you won't. You hate hard work. And you'll marry some rich man and come home to sit in the lap of luxury all your days. Joe! Your predictions sometimes come to pass, but I don't believe that one will. I'm sure I wish it would, for if I can't be an artist myself, I should like to be able to help those who are. Besides, in a year or two I'll send for you, Joe, and we'll dig through relics and carry out all the plans we've made so many times. That's very kind of you to offer, Amy. Thank you. I'll remind you of your promise when that joyful day comes, if it ever does. There was not much time for preparation, and the house was in a ferment till Amy was off. Joe bore up very well till the last flutter of blue ribbon vanished. When Joe retired to the attic where their old clubhouse resided, she cried till she couldn't cry anymore. 
Amy likewise bore up stoutly till the steamer sailed. Then, just as the gangway was about to be withdrawn, it suddenly came over her that a whole ocean was soon to roll between her and those who loved her best. Marmy, could I speak to you? What is it, Grace? You asked me the other day what my wishes were. I'll tell you one of them. I want to go away somewhere this winter for a change. Why, Joe? I want something new. I feel restless and anxious to be seeing, doing, and learning more than I am. I brood too much over my own small affairs and need stirring up. So as I can be spared this winter, I'd like to hop a little way and try my wings. Where will you hop? To New York. I had a bright idea yesterday, and this is it. You know Mrs. Kirk wrote to you for some respectable young person to teach her children and sew. It's rather hard to find just the thing, but I think it would suit me if I tried. Her family is separate from the rest, and no one knows me there. I don't care if they do. It's honest work, and I'm not ashamed of it. Nor I. But your writing? All the better for the change. I shall see and hear new things, and get new ideas, and even if I haven't much time there, I shall bring home quantities of material for my rubbish. I have no doubt of it. But are these your only reasons for this sudden fancy? No, Mother. May I know the others? It may be vain and wrong to say it, but I'm afraid... Lori is getting too fond of me, and... Oh, Marmy, I think Beth loves Lori. What makes you say that? A few days ago, she was ever so sad, looking out the window, and the only thing that brought a smile to her face was when Lori walked past. But as soon as he was gone, she seemed more heartbroken than ever. Well, I suppose that could explain her strange behavior. It makes sense. Lori flirts with Amy and jokes with me, but his manner to Beth has always been particularly kind and gentle. Stranger things have happened than Beth falling for him. She will make quite an angel of him, and he will make life delightfully easy and pleasant for the dear, if they only love each other. I don't see how he can help it, and I do believe he would if the rest of us were out of the way. Then you don't care for him in the way it is evident he begins to care for you? Mercy, no! <laughs> I love the dear boy, as I always have, and am immensely proud of him, but as for anything more, it, it's out of the question. <laughs> I'm glad of that, Grace. Why, please? Because, dear, I don't think you are suited to one another. As friends, you are very happy, and your frequent quarrels soon blow over, but I fear you would both rebel if you were mated for life. You are too much alike and too fond of freedom, not to mention your hot tempers and strong wills. To get on happily together, marriage needs infinite patience and forbearance, as well as love. That's just the feeling I had, though I couldn't express it. I'm glad you think he is only beginning to care for me. It would trouble me sadly to make him unhappy, for I couldn't fall in love with the dear old fellow merely out of gratitude, could I? You are sure of his feeling for you? He hasn't said anything, but he looks a great deal. And if I should be in the way of my dear's happiness... I know that I can't play matchmaker, Marmy. And maybe I am wrong. But I think I had better go away before Lori's feelings come to anything. I agree with you. And if it can be managed, you shall go. How Mrs. Moffat would wonder at your want of management. <laughs> Joe, mothers may defer in their management, but the hope is the same in all. The desire to see their children happy. Meg is so, and I am content with her success. You, I leave to enjoy your liberty till you tire of it, for only then will you find that there is something sweeter. Amy is my chief care now, but her good sense will help her. For Beth... I indulge no hopes, except that she may be well. By the way, she seems brighter this last day or two. Beyond your suspicions, have you spoken to her? Yes. She owned she had a trouble and promised to tell me by and by. I said no more. I trust you to make these decisions, Joe, especially if you feel it will help you, Lori, and maybe Beth. But I will miss you greatly. Beth must think I'm going to please myself, as I am, for I can't talk about Lori to her. But she can pet and comfort him after I'm gone and procure him of this romantic notion. He's been through so many little trials of love of the sort. He's used to it and will soon get over any lingering feelings. The plan was talked over in a family council and agreed upon, for Mrs. Kirk gladly accepted Joe and promised to make a pleasant home for her. 
The teaching would render her independent, and such leisure as she got might be made profitable by writing. Joe liked the prospect and was eager to be gone, for the home nest was growing too narrow for her restless nature and adventurous spirit. When all was settled, with fear and trembling, she told Lori, but to her surprise, he took it very quietly. Joe was very relieved that one of his virtuous moods should come on just then, and made her preparations with a lightened heart, for Beth seemed more cheerful and hoped she was doing the best for all. The morning she left for New York, she saved her last goodbyes for Meg, Beth, and Lori, while Mr. and Mrs. March watched tearfully from afar. Be safe and send me plenty of the wonderful stories you write. Daisy and Demi will want to know what their aunt Joe is up to, so she won't be around during the day. I'll be back soon, I promise. Keep an eye on Beth for me? Of course. One thing I leave in your especial care, Beth. You mean your papers? No, my boy. Be very good to him, won't you? Of course I will, but I can't fill your place. And he'll miss you sadly. It won't hurt him. So remember, I leave him in your charge to plague, to pet, and to keep in order. I'll do my best, for your sake. Write me often and don't suffer alone. Goodbye, my Bethy. I'll be back in just a few months' time. Your trunk is all loaded. Make sure you lift with your knees at the train station. I believe you packed an entire library. Be good, Lori. My eye is on you, Joe March. So mind what you do or I'll come and bring you home. Little Women, a radio play, will be continued in the next installment. Please visit www.littlewomenradioplay.com for more information. Little Women, a radio play, was written by Morgan McCall and Michael Carey, based on the novel by Louisa May Alcott. Our production was directed by Jessica Romro. Our lead audio engineer was Daniela Brown, with assistance from Joshua Taylor, David Lowen, and Alexis Nomorosa. Our stage manager was Alexis Nomorosa, and our assistant stage manager was Kaylee Wilson. Our assistant director was Autumn Ford, with music composed and engineered by Ryan Ardelk. The part of Joe March was played by Hallie Unruh, Meg March by Isabella Stevenson, Beth March by Evelyn Clark, and Amy March by Lauren Robertson. The part of Theodore Lawrence was played by Christian Shepard. Mrs. March, or Marmy, was played by Abby Yee, and Mr. March by Nick Phillips. Hannah Brown was played by Kaya Von Beck, Mr. Lawrence by Dalton Smith, and Aunt March by Gloria Hartung. John Brooke was played by David Lowen, and Professor Friedrich Baer was played by Eric Evans. The part of Fred Vaughn was played by Jackson Swain, Kate Vaughn by Rebecca Gadam, Annie Moffat by Gretchen Carpenter, Belle Moffat by Jessica Mangles, Clara Moffat by Leslie Apollinar, Ned Moffat by Connor Anderson, Mrs. Moffat by Eden Rutledge, Mr. Moffat by David Lowen, Mr. Lincoln by Hasiel Rodriguez, and Dr. Bangs by A.J. Flores. Our narrator was played by Anna Metis. A special thank you to the GCU Recording Lab, Christopher and Sarah Rumrill for lending your beautiful baby's voice, Candace Stewart, Morgan McCall, Michael Carey, and the College of Arts and Media. Thank you for joining us for Little Women, a radio play. <laughs>